So we have had a lot of excitement in the previous, uh, let's say, two fortnights, and the highlight of that has been the X planet Pluto. Now, uh, for younger children, Pluto has a different meaning. It has, you know, it is the Disney cartoon character, and uh, when I put this title, I kind of had a mental pun on that. But then it's also <coughs> true that Pluto has been part of the Greek mythology, and uh, Hades, the god of the underworld, had a dog called Pluto. So that's also a reference because that dog <coughs> is a really ferocious dog. It's not as timid and you know, fun like Pluto, the cartoon dog. However, for us, the astronomers, the amateur astronomers, and uh, even the professional ones, as you will see now, Pluto has a different meaning. Of course, it was dark till now. We didn't know much about Pluto till now, as you will get to see from the pictures. Uh, but in the recent months, Pluto has been really unleashed on us. A lot of information has been unleashed on us. Uh, well, Pluto has always been in the news, but especially in 2006, you might, uh, do you remember Pluto in 2006, what happened to it? Yes, so <coughs> poor Pluto, it was, you know, looked up down upon by the astronomers, not by the planets as is shown in this picture. <coughs> it's no more planet. That's right. So that is what happened in 2006 when uh, I remember I had just joined Ayuka in, uh, in, in the previous year and this uh, revolutionary thing happened where there was a big general meeting of the International Astronomers Union and they put up a vote whether Pluto should remain uh, in, its, in, its, in the status of a planet or not. Now, uh, I mean, you would first ask why would you even ask such a question? Pluto, I mean, there are planets in the solar system. We know nine big things in the solar system. We call them planets, that's it. But why should you ask such a question? So, please pause your questions for a little bit more because I will come to that question with very revealing pictures and infographics. But it was done, the vote was done. Uh, a lot of astronomers voted and Pluto was demoted. So there was a you will cry all over the world, why do we suddenly have eight plants? Right? We have been all through the generations, many generations I mean, uh, people have been you know, know, uh, knowing and reading and uh, memorizing sometimes that there are nine planets in the solar system. But suddenly there are eight. Even now we make mistakes saying, oh, nine planets. There is a website, very informative website called nineplanets.org. Well, one could not change that to eightplanets.org. <laughs> uh, but on the website, the label has been uh, cut off, striped off, and it says eight planets. So Pluto came out. Now Pluto is currently called a dwarf planet and it is, as we know now, the largest dwarf planet of our solar system. So if you look at uh, some profiles uh, information of the dwarf planet Pluto, we see that its mass, if written in kgs, is a long number, it's a very big number. But if you compare it to the Earth's mass, it's a very small number. <coughs> so both sides of the decimal there are lots of zeros. Okay, so it's a very small body. It's not very big. It's a rocky uh, object. Its mass is just very very small. It's much smaller <coughs> than the even the moon. Now the diameter as has been found now is two three seven two kilometers. It's two thousand kilometers, which would be maybe double uh, the size of Maharashtra. <laughs> Not too big. So it's a, a tiny planetoid. It has five known moons. Now this is very exciting that 
uh, an object so far away also has moons and it's so tiny, smaller than our moon and even that has moons. Okay. So what would those moons be like? We'll come to them. Their names are the uh, Sharon, Nix, Hydra, Kerberos and Styx. All these names come from Greek mythology, again related to the underworld and the dark things that dark gods. Um, the distance of orbit, however, is really big. Okay. It's many kilometers. And this is an average distance because as you would know, planets don't go around the sun in a complete perfect circle. They are, they are moving around in an ellipse. However, for small planet I mean closer by planets like the Earth, that ellipse is not too elliptical. Okay. So that the difference might be just uh, you know a fraction of a percent when you see how far the earth is at its farthest point from the sun and how far it is when it's closest to the sun. But for Pluto it is a big difference and in some uh, occasion or during some years its orbit actually comes inside the orbit of Neptune. So it uh, as it happened, it was a planet at that time. It, it had actually come inside the orbit of Neptune and it was the closest planet. So it was the eighth planet, it's close, the ninth planet. But uh, it's now demoted, so no longer planet. However, it has it is at a huge distance from us. And this is uh, this is the same number written in terms of astronomical units. An astronomical unit is the distance between the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, which would be around 150 million kilometers. So it is around 39 and a half times or quarter times farther from the Sun than the Earth is far from the Sun. So it's 39 times more farther. Just imagine that. Now think of one thing. It's a very simple exercise which uh, we can do that. We know that the sunlight from uh, the sunlight comes to the earth in 500 seconds. That's because all those light travels at a really high speed, it still is a, has a finite speed and uh, at 3 lakh kilometers per second, it takes 500 seconds to come here. Now how many seconds would it take to get to, so you calculate that, it's uh, say 8 and a half minutes to come to uh, the earth, it's 40 times more. So at an average distance, I'm, I'm talking about an average distance. So how much is that? 4.5. Five hours, let's say. Yep. Let's say. Okay. So uh, so light from the sun takes five hours to get to Pluto. And of course, there's another thing to remember that when light goes away from the sun, it gets radiated in all directions. Therefore. The intensity of the light which reaches Pluto is also less, it's much less. So in fact, if you go to the surface of Pluto, if you could land on the surface of Pluto, you would see the sun just about the brightness of the full moon. Okay, so it's dim as well as late, the light. <coughs> of course, we don't care what light reaches Pluto and <laughs> whether it's a moonlit uh, night all the time on Pluto. But there is something else which matters. So we'll talk about that. Do, do keep this in mind. Its period of orbit around the uh, around the sun is about two forty six years, Earth's years. Okay. So therefore, uh, we soon come to know that. Uh, let's say, let's skip this. Its discovery date was eighteen February nineteen thirty. So it has not even completed one <laughs> rotation around the sun since it was discovered. It will be a long time till it does so. Okay. Now the surface temperature has been uh, estimated to be minus 229 degrees centigrade. You just think of that. Uh, maybe if, if there are any chemistry students here, do you know any kind of uh, liquefaction points of any gases? So carbon dioxide, the gas which is also present in our atmosphere, it becomes a solid, goes directly from gas to solid at around minus 20 degrees centigrade. Okay. Minus 20, this is uh, 
200 times, uh, sorry, 200 degrees centigrade, even lesser than that, right? So just imagine if you are breathing out carbon dioxide there, just please. Yeah, of course, you wouldn't be breathing out carbon dioxide, but just imagine that, you could do that, right? So it's really cold, okay? That's something we need to know. And hence, expecting that there would be a uh, lot of vapors around, a lot of gases around in the atmosphere of Pluto, it may be slightly very optimistic. Okay. So uh, these are, this is the discovery date and it was discovered by Clyde Tongo. And I in fact did want to put the last slide because this picture says it all. Uh, if there are any collectors, this is something you can earn some money and uh, hope to own. This is a signed picture by Clyde Tombaugh which says, I discovered Pluto on uh, 13th February 19, 18 February 1930. Okay, autograph picture. That's the young Tombaugh. And youngsters had a lot of role during the discovery times of Pluto. <coughs> so the <coughs> discovery was something which an amateur astronomer could also participate in. This is something you can carry home, this message you can carry home. That uh, the method which uh, Clyde Tombaugh followed was that he used a telescope at a place called the Lowell Observatory. You see it's a photograph, uh, let's see the Lowell Observatory. Uh, he used that telescope to take pictures of the sky. And he used to take pictures very regularly. Okay, that is something you would have to do if you are a serious astronomer. Amateur or professional, doesn't matter. You would have to take a lot of pictures right? because your eye cannot store the images. However, uh, if you have stored images, you can at your leisure compare the images of the sky. That is what a lot of amateur astronomers do across the globe. They take pictures of the sky. They are usually not looking for planets. They are probably looking for comets or supernovae, which are bright objects which might be either shifting their position in the sky or growing brighter or dimmer. Okay. Now, of course you must have already looked at this picture and found that this, uh, uh, this point object marked by this arrow has moved till here. And if you compare these two pictures, uh, here it will not be visible. It was somewhere here. It's not visible. It has moved here. Okay. Of course this takes, you can see how, uh, you know, how minutely you have to look at the picture. It is just one tiny object, right? You don't have the Hubble telescope at your disposal. It's just a, uh, you know, maybe a 20 inch telescope, but you have to find the faintest object possible in that. That's what uh, Tombaugh discovered, this point <coughs> moving from here to here, okay? And <coughs> uh, you can see that it also says here, it is Lowell's mathematically predicted trans-Neptunian planet, okay, afterward named Pluto. And it is taken at the Lowell Observatory. So that's something uh, you need to know. That Percival Lowell, another great astronomer, of course, sometimes, uh, you know, he is uh, disrespected because although he through very good observations of the planet Mars and he made good maps of it with whatever capacity he had. He saw some lines on it with his low resolution telescope. And what he did was he said there are canals on Mars. Even now, even now, no, even now that no. Percival Lowell, Percival Lowell, another great astronomer, another great astronomer. Course, sometimes, uh, Uh, that is sometimes uh, what he is uh, disrespected for, but then he did set up the Percival, uh, the Lowell Observatory where great people, diligent people like Clyde Tombaugh would work and make such discoveries. Lowell was also a mathematician, so there was no difference between a mathematician and a physicist <coughs> and a chemist or something at that time. These are just branches which have come out recently, but uh, you could specialize in many things. So Lowell had been working on uh, various observations and he had predicted mathematically that there is a certain amount of perturbation 
in the orbit of Neptune, which is supposed to go around in a certain orbit, given the effect of all the other planets around it, is known. But you can always do the calculations and match them with the observations. So you predict some uh, position of the planet by your calculations and putting in all the forces. And you see that the planet is not observed there, but it's slightly moving. It may not be done in one day. It takes months to do such observations. Neptune is also a very far away object and it takes you know, hundreds of years to go around the sun. So over the years people found that yes, there is a slight perturbation and they were expecting it to be by uh, because of another big planet outside Neptune, which outside Neptune's orbit, which we had not discovered. And that is why Laval set up this observatory. And a trans-Neptunian planet was discovered by Clyde uh, Tombo at the same observatory. So that's a great state to such observations. Neptune is also a very far away object and it takes hundreds of years to go around the sun. So over the years people found that yes, there is a slight person and they were expecting it and they were expecting it to be by because of another big planet outside the and that is why Nautilus set up this observatory. And a trans Neptunian planet was discovered by planet X otherwise. It was the 10th, it was 9 planet, but you know, X marks the unknown. So it was called Planet X all over the world, and there was a naming competition. And it was won by this 11 year old girl, Venetia Birdie. So, Venetia Bernie, 1930, Disney was very popular, right? So many people say, okay, she didn't have all the, uh, you know, great thoughts and knowledge about the ecology and Pluto and all that. She probably named it after her favorite cartoon character. But it is not so. Because at the time, in 1930, Pluto was actually called Grover. So the name of this character Pluto was changed in 1931 by Disney to Pluto. So it could not have been that. So it's clearing up misconception or misinformation. So Venetia actually came up with this name and she's still famous, right? In fact, uh, uh, okay. what's her knowledge about what's her knowledge about ecology and Pluto and all that? She probably named it after probably named her favorite of cartoon character. But it is not so. But it is not so. Because at the time, in 1930, Pluto was actually called Grover. So the name of this character Pluto was changed in 1930. As it happened, people thought, let's send a mission to Pluto. And it was to fly to Southern Four. So they had to send a mission so that we could closely observe. So it was a uh, planned mission. This program of NASA it's called New Horizons and it's not just uh, one mission, it is a series of missions which NASA has planned to uh, reach out to the outer objects. Now what are these outer objects? As you can see that, oh sorry, uh, as you know there is a certain concentration of objects outside the orbit of Neptune. Uh, caused a lot of excitement but we never reached Pluto. So there was this plan in which we had to find our way to Pluto and observe it closely. However, as you know the distance is large so the plan had to be for a 8 to 9 year old uh, long journey, 8 to 9 year long journey and it was, uh, it came uh, to success with the launching of the New Horizons spaceship. So, this is the hopefully it clears. Okay, so that's the lift off of the mission. <coughs> An Atlas rocket. These moments are really exciting because you know, scientists and engineers work years to make a very precise instrument. Okay. Its size is around my height, so it's not a very big object, but it 
has so many tiny parts here and there that putting them on top of a million tons of explosive material, okay, explosive force, is is a very big risk. But they do it, okay. And each of these things works to the T, works to the perfection, and it gets launched. Okay, so that was the launch, which took us away from the Earth. And these are pictures taken by uh, pictures taken by New Horizons as it slowly went away from the Earth. You can see the earth turning there. So as it slowly went away, it had to do a lot of maneuvering because it's not so easy to launch a spacecraft directly onto an object in space. Because you know everything is moving. Earth is moving. Does anybody know the speed of the earth in its orbit? It's a mind boggling speed. It's, it's, it's close to 30 kilometers per second. Okay, one second and you're outside Pune. <laughs> and that's how that's how fast the earth is traveling in space. Right? And you are on it and you're trying to throw something outwards. And it has to hit, you know, exactly the bullseye. You are firing at a thing which is 39 times the earth's distance to the sun. <laughs> right? And it has to miss it by let's say a few thousand kilometers. Right? An earth's orbit, uh, earth's uh, circumference or diameter. Okay. So that's how close you have to go there. Hence, there is a lot of mathematics and physical calculations which go into it. And the maneuvering is such that the object is not launched straight, it is launched in a curved path. Okay. Moreover, we cannot launch too big objects from Earth because there is a lot of gravity and to counter that you have to use a bigger rocket and if it blows up then <laughs> you lose a lot of things. So you have to use a safer technology, safer, cheaper and less weight, you should have less weight. So this. Uh, spacecraft had a plutonium based engine. Okay. Plutonium is a radioactive thing. So there were concerns. Yes, because during the maneuver it had to pass the earth again. So once it goes out it comes and takes a gravitational pull and slings out. It's like doing this and then you throw the sling out. Right. So to do that it had to go past the earth and there was a concern. Okay, suppose it breaks up or something happens, it falls down to the earth. Will be you know uh, radioactive material all over the atmosphere. It didn't happen. You saw it it's safely past the earth, and then slowly after it's I mean it was launched before uh, Pluto became an an X planet, a dwarf planet. It went past in 2007, February 28, 2007, which was also National Science Day for us. It uh, took the assistance of Jupiter's gravity and flew past it. Now this is a short timeline that I have written here and in this you can see that in June it went into hibernation. Now while traversing this huge interplanetary space where there is nothing to see, right? how many times can you take pictures of the earth? <laughs> it's done, okay, fine, it's become a small dot now. So now you shut off. Then you don't use much energy, and that energy is preserved to charge the batteries so that they can be used at the moment of climax, okay, which is the encounter with Jupiter. Of course, it took, a, took some pictures of Jupiter also while going past it, but <coughs> it went into hibernation in 2007. It quietly kept going past Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. You can see the years progressing 2007, 8. 11, 14. Just imagine if you were in that journey, how bored you will be. <laughs> it's a very slow journey. Okay? So it's it's going, going, going. So seven years have passed. Neptune's orbit has been crossed. And then in 2006, uh, 2014, 6 December, we got, I mean, got a call saying wake up from NASA. We woke up, did a check, and everything was right. Next was April when it had to test its systems. So 
there are several systems on it, imaging systems as well as spectrum, spectral systems. So these have to be checked and it has, it is of course pointed towards Pluto. In April 9th is when we got the color imaging of Pluto. So we got some pictures of May, June was the most thrilling time for planetary scientists on Earth. They got the most uh, exquisite pictures of the Pluto system and of course they were still more I mean, hungry for more and finally on July 14th we got the closest approach to Pluto. I remember this being a very, I mean this was just <laughs> the beginning of this month, it was a very exciting period, I was spending most of the time online looking at the website, NASA has a website for Pluto's uh, New Horizons and what is the update coming, what is the update coming. However, I could not get real time updates. Can you guess why? It will take more and hours. Yes. Because information from any place to any place is transmitted usually by radio waves in space. Right? And radio waves are just light waves. And they take <laughs> 5 hours to get here. <coughs> in, in fact, in this case, it's about 7 hours. Right now, the distance between Pluto and the Earth is around 7 hours. So, it, it takes that much time for a picture to come to us. Moreover, you can't suddenly click a picture uh, in raw, you know, you guys use DSLRs, you <laughs> click a picture in raw which is you know, 150 MBs and just send it to Earth. Okay, it doesn't come by a USB 3 <laughs> connection. It's by radio waves. So, you can't send raw pictures. It will take uh, maybe 15 days to send a picture in that way. Right. So, you, so the pictures that you get are low, low res and also late. Okay. So of course, NASA has an amazing website and amazing outreach program which made sure that the excitement was there. They kept giving uh, you know, food for thought to people, kept providing some pictures as they came, and uh, we were all ready at 5:30 or PM 5:30ish <coughs> on uh, 14th July made a close pass to Pluto. So let's see how our view of Pluto changed. So this is a, this will continue. This is how we approach Pluto. See, this was Pluto way back in 2004. I'll of course show you some of these pictures in detail. So we went from just a few light spots, colored images to geographical images to close up images, it's like that. Okay, so now how are the views, views changed? You see, I remember this for a long time being Pluto being like this, okay, a grey thing with some <laughs> patches here and there, for a long, long time, since my school days. Okay, Pluto has been this, all the books I've read were this, and suddenly this year, Pluto has a heart. <laughs> okay, just see the change in the views. This was, of course, by one of the best instruments on Earth, Hubble Space Telescope. Okay, uh, oh, sorry, the, the Keck Telescope. Okay, and uh, Hubble Space Telescope has also taken pictures. So this is really remarkable. The change. <coughs> so let's rewind a little bit, and we are almost getting to. Pluto, and you can see some of the changes which were uh, noticed. Now, LORI is uh, is one of the images which maps the reflectance on the surface from the surface of Pluto. What does this mean? It means it checks how much light is being reflected from what region and makes a map of it or an image of it, photograph. Of it. Okay. Now, this Ralph, this instrument Ralph finds out, it's like a normal camera, it finds out what colored light comes, uh, light is coming. So it does not, LORI does not care what color it is, okay. All it wants is how much light is coming from which region, from in all uh, colors. And this guy cares only for the color. Okay. And to get the best images, what we have to do is we have to combine the images. Okay. So as you can see, uh, when New Horizons was approaching Pluto, about two weeks before the flyby, this is what we were getting and this was already exciting. 
you will of course have to notice that it is approaching from a northerly direction. So that's why you can see some part of the pole, but you can't see the other side. And there is a dark patch which has not been mapped. Okay. But then you have to make it, uh, you know, uh, you have to make compromises. You can't see the whole Pluto because this was not an orbiting mission. To make it an orbiting mission, the weight would have increased. Also, you would stop at Pluto. You wouldn't go further. So New Horizons is, has not stopped. It has come from uh, this far, taken pictures of reflectance and uh, this and given us very beautiful mind maps. After that, it also took wide angle pictures. Does this mean it just didn't zoom into, didn't just zoom into Pluto? It also looked at a wide view, a wide field view. <laughs> okay, so what you are seeing here is Pluto and its satellite Shah. <coughs> okay. The bigger one is Pluto and the smaller one is Shah. Now Sharon is also quite bright. Okay. Uh, it had already been discovered by the Hubble Space Telescope long back and we already knew it when knew about it when this was launched. Now what do you notice about this system? So suppose I'm, I have a string with a stone or some hard object attached to it and I move my hand around like this. Okay, so you will say that thing is going around my hand. Okay, but if I start moving my hand like this, it probably won't move properly. Yeah. It becomes a very different uh, kind of a system. Okay, in this case, <coughs> you notice that you will expect a satellite to be going around the the body the object which is there. However, you will notice that this thing itself is moving around the point which is somewhere here this body Pluto itself moving around the uh, thing uh, around the point which is somewhere here notice that so these <coughs> two have something called a barycenter it's when two masses are going around each other they have something like the center of gravity if you try to balance a, a long object on your hand okay if it's not properly weight distributed like one side is heavier one side is thinner and thicker, then you will have to put your finger towards the thicker side to balance something. That's what's happening. The finger is towards the thicker side, but it's not inside the planet. Okay. So Pluto here does not contain the barycenter of the pluto charon system. Right. Of course, we all uh, had figured this out by mathematical calculation, but this was one of the first pictorial views. This is a movie of the thing which made, which was the main uh, reason why Pluto was demoted from the planet position. So a very important movie to see. So what happened was that the planet's definition was changed. And it was changed to something like a hard object, which uh, a solid object which has uh, condensed by its own self gravity and it goes around the sun but also has cleared its neighborhood okay. and Pluto doesn't seem to have cleared its neighborhood because it is going around another thing. Yeah. So that is one of the first direct evidences of this wobbly nature that we already knew of. Okay. So what is this culprit Sharon all about? So one of the first pictures that came was of Sharon rather than, I mean clear picture which came was of Sharon rather than of Pluto. So this is a close-up view of Sharon and you can see it has a polar region dark compared to the other parts. Okay. <coughs> it has ridges and cracks in it, has pockmarked this side which we have not been able to see yet and this part was just coming into view when it was, uh, to, uh, sorry, New Horizons was a little far away. When it came really close to Sharon, it, it got to see some more uh, regions. And you'll notice this is something which is puzzling geologists right now. So it's not just astronomers. The planetary geologists of are also looking at the picture all the pictures all the time. And you'll notice if you take a close up of this and zoom in here, you'll notice that there's a 
it's a mountain in a boat is what they're calling it. Okay, so there's a there's an object stuck there. What is that? If you if you find out the scales, because we know what each pixel represents on a uh, photograph here. So each pixel here would be around 40 meters in length. Okay. So if you calculate how many pixels are from here to here, you will know the height of the mountain. Some, something like that. And a rough calculation will tell you that it's a big mountain <laughs> and it's inside a hole. How does that happen? There are no water flows on uh, Sharon. Here, okay, you can understand that you know a river might have carved a canyon around the mountain, but that's not happening on Sharon. So what is that? Some people say it's just an object which has hit really hard okay, and got guessed uh, in, uh, in that. We don't know yet, but that's what will happen as the high resolution data comes through. This is the low resolution image that have come to please all of us because we will be asking questions what is happening to new horizons. But this is what you will expect and this and even 10 times better. Right? So you might be able to see any close ups of this also later when the final data slowly arrives over the next one year. It will take a lot of time. So that's Sharon and a close up of that. Now Pluto uh, also has other moons of which two were imaged by New Horizons. These are again low resolution pictures combined pictures of from Laurie and uh, Ralph. The enhanced color picture of uh, Hydra and Nix. So this is Hydra and Nix. <coughs> so you can see that we would we would we could not see anything. There was just a pixel in the Hubble's <laughs> camera. But right now you can see that they are more like potatoes some odd dark regions here. So some more exciting. High resolution pictures yet to come. Now we will get to some close ups of Pluto itself. Oh. Yeah. Unfortunately I missed a picture there. <laughs> okay. uh, so, uh, so as you noticed one of the pictures of Pluto had uh, the closest picture of Pluto that we have got as a heart in it. Just have a look here. So this was one of the pictures, best pictures that of Pluto that we have. And as the uh, whole globe came into view, we noticed that there was a bright region which was shaped like a heart. You can imagine the heart. There is also a dark region. So this dark region with this, uh, you know, this dark region has been called the veil. With this crater being the eye of the veil. Okay. We are already putting names to that. However, we have also put good names to this. this. So this part, which was the most prominent and the most fantastic part that people saw, is called the Tombaugh region. For obvious reasons. Region. Reasons. Uh, so this picture is of a mountain range which lies at the southwestern margin of the Pluto's arc. Okay. So, so here this is south and what we are looking at is this part. So this is uh, one of the close-ups uh, close and you can see that this is a sharp boundary between the dark areas and the bright areas. Uh, people uh, before the mission started, people didn't even know what the color of Pluto was. Right? And now we are going to this kind of resolution where we can see you know, marked differences of colors. Also, uh, as we came closer, you saw in the pictures, we were thinking that Pluto was completely red and there are questions that if there is no oxygen, how can there be oxidation and why would I talk about oxidation because you know Mars is red because of iron oxide in its soil but how would you put oxides onto Pluto? That is still a question. People are trying to find other ways in which on which uh, sorry, due to which the surface of Pluto could be reddish in color. And these pictures is what uh, are what will give us the clues to that. This is a beautiful uh, you know, uh, picture just to see. It looks so much like the Siberian regions where there are mountain ranges and glaciers and crack, cracks in them. So this might actually be ice. Okay. Only covered with different kinds of 
material on top of it. And not just water ice, it could be methane ice. So methane is another gas which uh, is present in large amounts in the outer planets and this could even be methane ice. Look at another region which is more like a glacier and a ice field. So you can see this has <coughs> some troughs with dark material and some, some places where there are small spots, some places where there are hills, slightly higher region. And we are still figuring out what is that. And here you can see the scales. There is 20 miles on the size of the city of Pune. This would be like that, small village. And this is a portion of the Sputnik plan. Now slowly the global map will also be released by uh, NASA with the names. Right now it's just a plain map that they have, been, they have released uh, a few days, two days back I think. So please keep a watch on that. So this was what, I mean I, that's all the pictures that I have of Pluto and the current um, mission. However, I would not finish this without telling you a little bit more about the other objects which are still to be explored and which scientists would like to go to. And these are the dwarf planets. Okay. Uh, I just, uh, in short, told you this statement which defines a dwarf planet now. It is, a, it is in direct orbit of the sun. It is massive enough for its shape to be in a hydrostatic equilibrium under its own gravity and it should not have cleared its neighbor. So there should be something around it and it should be captive by that. So that is Pluto. But other than that, there are other five dwarf planets in the solar system now. <coughs> So in order of this picture, there is Ceres, is Pluto, this is Make Make, this is Eris, another uh, dwarf planet, another big dwarf planet with a moon, this is Nomia. And this is the fifth one discovered, which is Haumea with two moons, one and two. This is Yaka and Namaka. Okay. These names are slowly getting more and more weird because they are habituated to Greek now. <laughs> no longer Greek to us, but now we have to, uh, this this name is from the Easter Islands, gods of the Easter Island, and this is from Hawaii, so, you, yeah, sorry, this is from, uh, still from Greek mythology. this is from that Pacific area, okay. <coughs> now, you will see that these are the pictures taken by best telescopes on the earth, and that's what they look like, and now we have Pluto suddenly looking like this, and Ceres was also discovered, uh, also visited by a spacecraft this year only and that was another exciting time. So let me uh, share with you that after I tell you about some, uh, I mean after I just show you this view graph about other trans-Neptunian objects. So Pluto is this, Sharon, I mean they are not all spherical. It's, you can notice that Haumea has been estimated to be <coughs> slightly, slightly elliptic. Eris was discovered in 2004 and we didn't know that it would cause so much of a dispute when it suddenly became competition for Pluto to become a planet because it was just about the size of Pluto and it was in the solar system. So if we had Pluto, we should also make Aries a planet or demote Pluto. Fine, we might consider making it a planet. But what happened next is that another person discovered Haumea, you know, another team discovered Haumea. So now we have to change our uh, list of planets every year because better and better technology is coming. We are getting better and better uh, telescopes. We could discover so many more. So what do we do? Astronomers decided that we stop at eight and then classify the rest if they are not really big and uh, you know, use, uh, useful. They are out there. We will call all of them as dwarf planets. Right? So that's. Uh, a list of, uh, uh, sorry, uh, pictorial uh, uh, representation of all the others which have been discovered, which are also in, you know, consideration for dwarf planet. But this, 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 and this are definitely called dwarf planets. Sedna is still being considered. Now, these pic, uh, pic, this picture also tells you slightly uh, the slight information that we have about the colors, the surface colors of the transnational objects that have been found. Okay. So, <clears throat> I'll also take you to a small journey. 
and not make this due to the hero. Uh, also this year we reached the dwarf planet Cheris and it was visited by a spacecraft called Dawn. Uh, it was launched in 2007, right, later than uh, New Horizons, went past Mars and it orbited Vesta, an uh, asteroid, a uh, huge asteroid and then it went to Cheris. Now Cheris and Vesta have been known for a long time. In fact, and there was some time when Shellis was called a planet, then it was not called a planet, and finally now it's a dwarf planet. Okay. So Shellis is another intriguing object which has been visited. <coughs> and as you would see, it looks like the moon, and you would say, why did we spend so much money to go there? It's just, it's just another grey object which is Pokemon. We already knew that. Okay, but that's not the spirit. Spirit is discovery, and we did discover something. And I think Right now, although there is a lot of excitement about Pluto and we are getting high risk pictures and we will keep getting them, there is a, still a mystery. Okay. This is the really good resolution pictures that we have of Shellis. And this is one of my favorite craters <laughs> I mean, from all the pictures that I have got. It is a nice one with a mountain in between. Again, a curious thing. But that is not a mystery. A mystery is something like this. You see, there is a, there's a, there's a dark region and this part is really bright. And we don't know why. Nobody knows why. Yet. We have been seeing it, we have been coming closer to Sheris. Now it is orbiting and taking pictures. Dawn is orbiting and taking pictures. But we don't know what this is. Just have a look. See this? What is this? <laughs> And you will notice there are several, I mean for, at first people thought that was only that was odd, but there are other places where such uh, bright spots are happening. This is really, really curious, mysterious. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, after we get to the depth of this mystery is when my excitement will probably go down a little bit. However, I will come to the end of the talk by showing you another exciting Thing, which is the complete journey of the spacecraft New Horizons from Earth to Pluto. There's no sound, but you know that's the new horizons. <coughs> it's leaving the Earth. This atmosphere. You can see there are several gadgets on both sides. Uh, radio antennas afterwards pointed towards the Earth, so you can communicate constantly. It's passing through the Jupiter sphere. It passed Io here. These are the two cameras, this is Laurie and Ralph and on the other side there is a small tablet kind of a thing. You will notice it is passing through Jupiter's aurora, beautiful visual. Passing through the planetary space. This, this small section that you see is called the student dust counter. It does not count dust particles on a student, it is made by students and it is sent there. In fact, it has been named after Venetia Mars. So, that is another young participant who is reaching Pluto right now. That is the system coming into view and this is what we thought Pluto was like when the animation was made. That is the flyby. Our imagination of Sharon and Pluto. <coughs> and as, <coughs> as New Horizons passed by Pluto, it passed through its shadow. You notice at that time the atmosphere of Pluto comes into view. That was planned. And we just 
the latest picture is of that, the atmosphere of Pluto. And <laughs> although you would see it to be very, very faint and very slight here, it might actually be, although diffuse, it might actually uh, extend up to the, uh, the diameter of the Earth. So it could be really big. So right now, it's sending signals and which will come to Earth. It has been turned around now. It was busy taking pictures, so it, it didn't care where the radio antenna was pointed. Once in a while, when it was towards us, it would send the pictures. And now, it will keep going outwards until it's <laughs> uh, battery finishes. Of course, there is still a lot of battery power, which will go on till the end of 2016, I think. Uh, so that was the end of 2016, in which it will keep sending us data, and then we'll hear more from the scientists at the end of 2016. So another round of interesting uh, pictures coming up. Thank you, I'll finish here.